Hello everyone, this is Ross at Teacher Talk at the most influential blog on education in the UK. Today I am delighted to be joined by Mark from Wellbe, who is going to tell us about the amazing stuff that his software does for schools, the amazing insights. I've been privileged to work alongside him over a number of months now. And if I just give you a bit of context, 10 years ago you'd struggle to find much academic research on teacher happiness and pupil outcomes. Uh, and I was quite against tracking teacher well-being, but I've totally gone, uh, I've done a U-turn uh, and I'm uh, a big fan for tracking insights and analytics to determine what school leaders should do next. Anyway, so that's enough from me. Let me introduce you to Mark. Mark, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for joining me. Good afternoon, Ross. It's a pleasure to be here. And could you, I just get you to uh, introduce, you know, the headline, you know, yourself and Welby, and then I'm going to unpick just a little bit about you first before we get in, down to business. Yeah, no, it's fine. So I'm Mark Solomon, um, I guess, founder and CEO of Welby, uh, a business that uh, we launched uh, just shortly before COVID. Um, got off to a great start, 100 schools very quickly in three months, uh, unfortunately. Um, the challenges of COVID, as I know, it impacted everyone in schools, it impacted us as well uh, in terms of people wanting to do things around well-being, but perhaps um, having so many more important things to do in terms of just keeping the doors open. Um, so it's been an interesting uh, a time, but we're now up to 350 schools and, and growing. And so, um, you know, really trying to help uh, leaders keep their staff in schools, keep their teachers in the classroom and, and help them to uh, enjoy uh, the uh, the role that they they carry out that really important role and uh, achieve the real uh, or the best student outcomes uh, that they can. So three hundred fifty schools and you know pre pandemic and then having to get through all that headache. Um, I think you're doing quite well to be honest. Um, could I? Um, how did the idea come to life? Um, so I. Uh, I'm in my second career now. I'm sure you might go into that, um, but I spent 23 years in retail banking first and was um, uh, retail director of St. Jude's Bank. And, and um, that certainly had some influence in terms of my thinking about employee engagement, about employee well-being and pulling cultures together. Mm -hmm. I, then, I then for the last 12 years of work supporting um, hundreds of schools, thousands of school leaders, really around culture and um, and um, leadership and well-being and a little bit on student outcomes as well before that which i'll, I'll talk about i'm sure at some point mm -hmm. um, i was working with um, 17 schools around belfast in 2016 with a fantastic uh, school lead that has set it up uh, michelle who's the head at uh, ballyclare high school um, and they were a really interesting school because since 2010 they'd been measuring each year the well-being of their staff using their right. health and executives indicator tool and so they've been tracking this so ahead of their time and yeah, really ahead of their time, yeah. in action and i thought i was quite interested and intrigued but more importantly the other 16 schools that were working with them uh, also working with us on on this sort of consultancy project around well-being and leadership and um, all kind of went well i quite like that so i volunteered mm. i said well let me um see what i can do so a um i guess a, sur a survey monkey plus so a little bit better type structure i went about running these surveys for schools um and um once the surveys were closed it used to take me seven hours per school i used to spend about a whole, almost right. a, a day a typing up each report and, and kind of going but people seem to like it and um, i thought yeah. this is an interesting idea and i did a few for some other schools i was working with but quickly realized that this is not a sustainable business to get a bit more efficient yeah not write all these particularly as the price point was similar to is now which is, is very affordable um so spending all my time writing these things um so i was thinking about it and interesting I, uh, I guess the second origin i was i was one day um there and this twitter uh, message came up from an accelerator in liverpool saying hey are you are you got a business idea but yet you don't want to put your own money in um mm. talk to us so I thought, well, this is interesting. So I, I responded to them uh, and I got uh, an email back or, or, or a Twitter message, can't remember which now, saying, hey, yeah, we'll be in touch. Um, thanks for representing. And about a day later, uh, I got a message uh, from uh, from them as well saying, um, uh, hi, I'm your mentor. Um, and so I got this 26-year-old mentor from an accelerator, which obviously for someone 
uh, was quite interesting. They were brilliant, yeah. I have to say. And uh, the rest of Sainz history, they helped me um, take it to a digital product. They helped me. Right. Um, so get quite, uh, quite an interesting, organic, uh, a kind of necess necessity in some respects also. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and we managed to raise investment, uh, quite substantial investment. Um, people don't sometimes, I think, realise how much it does go into building these yeah, stuff. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, we're there a year on and, as I say, I'm growing. So I think... Well, I think... well um, I'm going to interrupt you. Let's come back okay. to well-being and um, find out a little bit more about how it can help schools, teachers, etc. Uh, but I, I like to get to know who uh, I'm having a conversation with. So I want listeners to, uh, I guess, understand your background and, and guess what motivates you. And you mentioned retail banking earlier, but I'm going to go back further than that. Yeah. Uh, could you describe your 16 year old self? I can. Well, actually, it's interesting because I come from a place very near where you're living now. Right. Um, so, uh, I'm a Huddersfield boy, even though okay. I've been down south since 1986. I'm still very much Yorkshire at heart. Um, yeah. I don't get against anybody else if they're not. Um, but uh, but I still very much think of myself as, as northern. Uh, my yes. family is still up, up, up there. Uh, as a 16 year old, uh, I guess um, I, 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 I guess some differences. I did have hair uh, in, in those days. <laughs> Um, I was very lucky, actually. I had very loving parents, um, and I guess people describe us as middle class. So mm -hmm. um, we, we weren't short of things. Um, we, 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 neither we were wealthy, but I had a very loving parents, which I think you know is it, very important. I was very lucky, and I recognise that. And I was very lucky with my schooling as well, um, in that I managed to get into a, a, what was then a grammar school. Um, obviously, uh, Labour then uh, removed grammar schools in, in the right. north, uh, largely, but um so for me i was going to this good school uh, and interestingly i didn't do very well in my education not because i don't think i'm bright i think i've proved that later you know i've been looking for things like an mba and i did go to university but i, I never really worked at school i wasn't i wasn't a bad person i wasn't misbehaved but it never really engaged me and i think that in terms of my support for education um in terms of um being a governor for 20 odd years and a trust mm -hmm. year, and in terms of the first work I did in education was building a character education program, writing a book on resilience and forming a, a, a national charity with the then vice chair of the Olympic Association was all probably formed by wanting to help young people yeah. to, uh, to take the program then to be the best they could be. And a lot of it came out of my experiences for, for, for school that I did not take the opportunities of what was a really good schooling. What, what happened after after school? Did you pop straight into a job or off to I, university? I, I went to, I went to um, university. Um, I can say it lowly, it's actually a polytechnic, but it's now a university um, because I didn't do as well in my A-levels as, as I expected. Um, I, I went through the clearing system. I took a subject I knew nothing about, uh, which mm -hmm. was economics. Um, right. I still don't know why I took economics. Um, <laughs> Did all. it help? Well, you went into banking, so it must have been useful. Yeah, I don't think, I can't say, um, I think I understood it and enjoyed it more when I did my MBA um, than I did on my, on my right. university uh, course. Um, but I'm still not quite sure. Um, I should have probably mentioned that I did have a teaching influence growing up because my mum was a primary school teacher. Aha, there we go, there we go. So that's, that's where true. that's where the connection's made, everyone. Yeah, so so um, why, why banking? Um, well, actually, my first job, and, and I think why I, I'm a little bit cheeky and very confident, um, so at the age of 21, when I came out of university, I actually started life as an insurance salesman. So I spent a whole year selling insurance. And so I used to go, um, you know, uh, and imagine this as a young man coming mm -hmm. out, uh, even if one that's confident, I used to go over to Leeds from Huddersfield. That's a 35, 40 minute drive. And every morning I'd go and sit in what I guess can only be described as a little phone poof pod with a door. And you'd sit down there with your desk and your leads <laughs> and you'd phone people to say for next week saying, and your job was every day. Hey, people still pay thousands in London to do that physically well, I, <laughs> even well, I, yeah i i phoned out booked my own appointments and then the following week i'd go and see them to try and obviously sell and this is pre you know i look back now and some of the training this is pre-regulation when when most things kind of went but i guess what it taught me if you've ever had to cold call so i get cold calls all the time and the one thing i am my wife says why why are you that why why, why don't you just 
hang up or everything I say, because yeah. I know what that's like. So I'm always really polite to them and I'm always saying, look, it's not very helpful. And I give them several chances to kind of just go away politely if it's not interesting, because I recognise how hard. Yeah, yeah, it's very hard, yeah. It is and, hard to be nice in that situation also, isn't it? And one of the really other interesting things is I had three client types. So you imagine this 21-year-old. 20, my clients were solicitors, local businessmen, and head teachers. So who knew that even at that stage I was ringing and yeah. I was looking to see a few to try and sell to head teachers. And it's kind of full circle because here I am again. Uh, yeah, full- so I'm starting to connect the dots a little bit and I'm starting to see how, um, you know, even the cold calling experiences, uh, you know, your mother's influence from teaching and, and that, you know, how it all uh, well, leads, did- points to where we are today. Well, I did want, and I'm not just saying this to, to gather sympathy or whatever, but actually I seriously, for a period, wanted to be a teacher. I used to go and help my mum when I was 16, 17, 18 in the summer when she t- they took their um, visits out, um, their primary school children went out on, um, so I think it was usually set year seven, year eight, and so I'd go along as a helper, and I yeah. definitely enjoyed it. And I'm not quite sure why I never did, it just didn't happen, and I kind of went out there. And again, I lasted a whole year. I joined as a group and I lasted a whole year with that insurance, which actually was quite a record because of the four people that started with me, there was only one left. And I probably saw in that year 30 or 40 people join and, and most of them leave. Yeah. I lasted a year before I just had enough. Uh, right. And then I, 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 I was on the dole for... Uh, so was that also some motivation behind the well be kind of insights that you're producing today? Well, I, th- I think probably that's too early. I probably at that age, I was still, I was still thinking about what next. And again, yeah. I, I just applied for a graduate trainee job with a Halifax second year. But I think the confidence I got got me that job because there was something like ten thousand applicants and eleven jobs. And right. Somehow I managed to get one. Talking about bank assurance in my in my interview before it had even come up. And the probably the two biggest influences then that have really led me to where I am are. Um, I, I, I became a branch manager at the age of, I think I was 26, um, having been assistant manager in a big branch. So very young, really. And I had this premises and 20 staff and was in Streatham, yeah. in Streatham London. And I was kind of uh, uh, given the keys, which is fantastic. But I got a fantastic boss. And, you know, if I look at that boss now and the mentorship and the coaching I got and thinking, gosh, if I had him, what would have happened? Mm-hmm. The second thing was a one training course. I was very lucky, uh, as graduate trainees often are, to have this fantastic training. Uh, probably too much for someone that young. I had my own coach. I went to Brathy Hall. I had, uh, you know, I'm very grateful for this. But the one course that stands out uh, when I was 24 or 25 was but with a snazzy title of um, Managing by Walking About. And yeah. I just, they actually taught you how to praise people, how to not go around the same route every day, how to talk to them about things outside work, um, how to get the most out of them by not just talking about the thing you wanted to. Yeah, now we've oh, we've spoken about this idea before and I absolutely love it. So I probably want to unpick this a little bit more to give uh, new, current, aspiring, uh, established, experienced leaders out there listening uh, a few little tips. So can I pop back to that in a moment, Mark? Um, yeah. I'm coming back to this, some kind of headlines. So if you can give me... Uh, a nice punchy kind of, um, what, what is Wellbe first of all? What is it? So we help time pool leaders to systematically measure and improve staff well-being without really adding too much to their workload and by helping them to take action. Uh, okay. Every so uh, so how, how do they do that? What, what's involved? So um, we're often thought of a survey company because I guess it does start with a survey, but I'm always at pains trying to say, no, no, we're much more with about a, a staff wellbeing improvement company. But if you're, going to, if you're going to improve anything, you have to know where you are now. In the same way of schools, particularly secondary schools, but all schools are tracking the progress of their pupils. They don't yeah. wait until they take an exam to see what happens. Uh, and in fact, in anything in life, if you want to improve, you have to know where you are now. So we start with a survey. It's an evidence proven survey, um, evidence built, I should say, independently evaluated for its psychometric qualities. And importantly, for those interested in the staff wellbeing charter, it actually is recognised within uh, that because we use the health and safety executive indicator tool, which is freely available. But what we've done is built a, a, a comprehensive 
reporting framework around it. So those people who love rich data, who want to, you know, knock themselves out with it, hey, um, yeah. you really can. But for those people like me who actually just want to get on with things and perhaps want the data made easy, we've not only um, turned it into a report, but we recommend uh, or suggest actions to take based on scores. And those scores are benchmarked, which is really important. And we also suggest who those actions might be taken with. Um, sure as well as celebrating. So the idea being that if you're really busy, because too often I see schools doing their own thing, uh, and that's great, and I wouldn't stop them. And in fact, on our website, there's a guide to running your own survey because we just want people to take action. Um, but often, if you haven't got it systematic, if you're not suggested actions, I see too many people not actually getting to the actions because they're just so busy. So it's all, yes. I've done all this work, we've done all this analysis, but we don't actually use it. So every sure do is to make it easy for leaders to take action so we can't do it for them because, but, you know, so maybe. so uh, i'm trying to articulate so there's people listening to this podcast there's people watching us on the uh, our video version too um i log into a bit of software there's a, a good series of questions if i'm looking at it first the school tailors the questions it then turns out a good bit of data i get all the pie charts the color coded uh graphs and there's some recommendations on a succinct pdf for school leaders to take would i be far off the mark or uh yeah, getting close? Uh, no and you've got some close things i mean clearly we built it in a way that um you don't have to download things it's all online um you've got your report as you said um the course survey is 35 questions and you can't change that and um if you're going to track why would you and in fact, if you look at um, people talking about Ofsted, for instance, or talking about culture, I think the HSC is the best match for, for, for both of those. It looks at the management standards um, that schools can really use. Um, but you can download things for those schools that want it. Uh, as I say, that detailed report, benchmarks, which is really important because one of the challenges, again, if you don't have benchmarks, is you end up looking at your highest scores and your highest scores might not be your comparatively highest scores if you see what i mean mm -hmm. uh, but you could end up working on things where you're already better than uh, maybe many others or you ignore things where your total score looks higher but actually there's plenty of headroom for, for, for sure growth. so i guess the the benefit is that once i'm part of you know so obviously we've mentioned a school can do it independently and get on with their own bit of information and they might be time poor and things fall on their feet i guess the challenge with doing it individually is you don't benefit from the being part of that community where you can all profit from the data and insights. So you mentioned at the start, there's 350 schools. Uh, I guess the question is, um, what, 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 what insights do you get looking at all the schools using the survey? And the second question is how can each of the individual schools profit from this powerful data collectively? Um, so, so we, we obviously see the trends and we just actually rewritten some of our actions uh, based on, on um, obviously what we're seeing. Um, so we keep abreast of, of uh, uh, changes or um, things that we hear from schools that we mm -hmm. can adapt and put in. Um, so there's that. Um, you're obviously benefiting from those benchmarks across uh, the schools. If you are working with a cluster group of schools, for example, or a local authority group, or you're part of a MAT, then those schools can also internally benchmark against themselves, and they can also do that anonymously, so in a way that allows them to see where they're sitting locally, but mm -hmm. um, without actually having to kind of... Um, Name and shame, I suppose. Yeah, and um, because, you know, one of the things that we must at any cost protect against is i mean can you imagine a, a, a league table for well-being uh, and scores uh, you know and sadly yes. i see that happening sometime but not on not from us and not on our watch so we're very much about how do we help people it's also why we haven't brought up our own awards because we want people to talk about well we're a well-being school which means we take well-being seriously not because we've got a badge for our website we want people to actually take action that benefits staff and to mm -hmm. talk about that, um, as opposed to just doing it for a, 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 a kind of badge. Now, I'm not saying all awards are just badges, um, but we've just made a conscious decision that really we want people to work with us because they're really doing something that mm -hmm. will benefit their staff so, and, so and, I, and their students because clearly there's lots of evidence that 
self-reported staff wellbeing has a causal impact on student attainment too. Yeah. Now you mentioned, um, you know, those insights and, you know, self-attainment and you, we don't want to league table schools, wellbeing and those types of things. Um, are there any, again, going back to the insights that you see across all the schools, are there any common characteristics of schools that are reportedly within your software stating, or it's, it's telling us that they're doing the right things with their staff? Um, yes. Um, so, I mean, staff wellbeing really is all about culture. Um, it's all about um, people feeling that they belong. It's all about people feeling that um, they're looked after, they're cared for. Um, I think, uh, you know, staff in schools don't expect miracles. I think they understand that they've joined a high workload profession. Um, yeah. They understand the challenges in the sector. And they're not expecting people to solve all the problems, but what they do want to feel is that they're consulted and they're listened to and they're supported. So really both from the scores, whether that's in the manager support sections or whether it comes through in relationships or role particularly, um, will all um, suggest where, whether the schools, the maps, the colleges are getting those things right. And mm -hmm. often when we've got high schools, they're very much supported by the comments we get because the platform also allows um, the capturing of comments and it also mm -hmm. allows to respond to those comments and have two-way anonymous conversations or anonymous as far as the staff are concerned and where we have the high schools we usually see they're supporting comments and they talk about how well I feel supported they how I can talk to my line manager when I've got a problem mm -hmm. um, how I'm consulted about things uh, as well so I don't think there's any secrets and i think it's yeah I, I guess bringing it all together you know making it work is the challenge you know in the context of where you might work in a school you know i've written these words down be feeling belong uh, a sense of belonging being looked after from whether it's a cup of tea to i need to go and pick up my child for child care etc uh, a, a, a sense of understanding in terms of the pressure points that we all face and having a voice i suppose that consultation from you know very detailed policies to just day to day should we should we paint the staff ro staff room door green or red <laughs> um i guess it's i guess it's some uh, those common threads th yeah, I, yeah, yeah absolutely I, I do a talk called um um culture cake and yoga um and obviously for me well being like building a house you know and you've got to get these foundations right and obviously that is the culture so that's the behaviors of leaders uh, and there are some great helps out there like um, the 12 competencies proven to prevent and reduce staff stress that gives some really good um, self-awareness for people perhaps who haven't had a lot of training of, of key behaviours that if mm -hmm. I do this way rather than this way, the impact that will have on reducing rather than uh, increasing stress. Um, whereas, you know, often schools do think about um, putting on yoga or a well-being day or kind of cakes. Now, there's nothing wrong with any of those. If you've got the foundations right, they can all help and build but too many times they're often the starting point and, and in one yeah. way it's understandable because it's much easier to put on something like that than, and, and, than address the real causes. Start with the culture, end with the cake is the, is well, the well, message. Well, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. There's nothing wrong with a bit, bit of cake. A bit of cake like is, is, good, is good for your um, well-being, uh, as you say. Um, and in terms of, I guess, one more detailed question I'd like to unpick is... Um, the the survey itself what kind of questions would you you know i i know your uh, software has some detailed questions but what if i wanted to do something for myself what kind of questions would you say are essential that all well-being surveys should ask um so if you want to use the questions that we use you can because they're freely available um, from 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 the government so i guess you know, it's really unpicking key areas. And I, that's why I like the one we use, because um, and when you use it, it's thinking about the key areas you're addressing. Um, so the, the management standards, I'm sure many of the people listening will know them, but it yeah. defines them into the six areas. But, you know, clearly how I feel supported by the manager, uh, by my manager and by my peers are, are key ones. So uh, things like I'm encouraged at work. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. um, I'm supported through emotionally um, uh, challenging uh, uh, events, things around workload uh, and understanding of workload. Um, uh, so I guess I'm picking up that, you know, that those themes 
belonging, looked after, understood. It kind of threads throughout the entire building, doesn't it? It does. And work, workload, so workload is important. Uh, and I widen it. Obviously, it talks about demands because it's not just workload. Uh, it's things that put pressure on me. So that's workload, deadlines, how things are managed, student behaviour, all these things yeah. that kind of put pressure on. Um, but it's not really about those things. It's about how they're managed. Um, so workload, I, I've got another great mentor in, in, in my business side who always talks about, um, you know, you've got you've um, you've got, you've always got too much to do. So quit quit trying to do it all. You know, um, and I've got, I've got I've got that sense of feeling today actually. And, and, and you know, I, I mean, you know, we were at the CST conference on on Friday, Thursday, yes. Friday. We were at the LGFL conference on first of July. We're constantly doing things. I mean, I could work, I could easily work till midnight every single night and, and occasionally do out of choice because things have to happen. Um, but the important thing is to recognise choice. I love what I do and I choose sometimes to do that. Sure. That, that I can choose not to. So the other thing we want to try and help leaders do is to help staff understand that, that actually they have some choice over it. It might not always feel like that and I'm not saying yeah. it's an easy thing, but to recognise that actually if they are working long hours, um, they are choosing now. They may feel that actually they don't have choice because of the environment and culture they work in. It's not a psychologically safe one. That actually they're only as good as their last year. But ultimately, we encourage people to try and obviously be assertive, stand up for themselves, um, support, and to help leaders understand that those are the concerns of of, of, of uh, staff. And the thing you've often talked about, Ross, is accountability, high stakes agenda and how we how we help staff yeah I, but i guess in those scenarios or or not is is going back to um you know giving people the tools or the awareness to self-regulate and then that's where that choice comes in if i've if i've got that awareness and understanding that if i choose to work late into the night i have a, a degree of autonomy around that decision rather than just dealing with the forces yeah. around me that make me have to work extra than I need to. Yeah. And so checking on whether staff feel pressured to work is, is that's another question in there. And also understanding where that pressure comes from. Is it coming from themselves or is it coming from the environment and the expectations sure. of, of the team are all kind of good things to, 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 to be thinking about. Now, um, thinking about what you said earlier, um, managing by walking about, tell us more about some of the, the tips and tricks you were given on this course that changed you, uh, your life as a young man. So um, I guess um, one of the things, so, so clearly um, people may not realise, but branch management then, or be preparing for branch management was all about um, sales really. Um, uh, people may not have realised, I'm sure they do, but obviously, when you work in the branch, it's about cross-selling, getting your cashiers to generate sales. And one of the things I noticed, because although I was still graduate training, I was working in branches and, and running counter teams and various things as my training. And I used to go in and just talk about what we're going to get today, what we're going to do. And so one of the things that this exposed me to was, was this balance between, yes, you've got your targets and the things you want to achieve, but actually... Um, having empathy for the people and, and the roles they're playing, understanding them, putting yourselves in their shoes, um, asking about their home life and the things outside, um, and you know, really getting to know them um, would have an impact on sales. And I was mm -hmm. a bit dubious, if I'm honest, um, thinking, well, this can't be right. But um, given that I was hungry and young and actually wanted to be successful, yeah. I thought I'd give these things a try. And so the, and I'll come back to the results of that. But the things we were taught was, look, um, the power of praise and recognition. Um, there is a, a research out there that shows um, how powerful this really is. And in fact, one, one piece of research from Japan suggested um, the, the rush it gives is as, um, is as powerful as a pay rise. Um, and given that, obviously, teachers haven't had pay rises for a while, I've seen that we're no. a big one at the moment. But um, anything we can do to create an environment where people... Um, feel good and want to work. Yeah, that reward loop, isn't it? Important. So um, they focus first on praise and, and saying, look, how do you go about meeting your, uh, talking to your staff? Now, one thing about schools that is a challenge is, of course, a lot of staff are hidden away in classrooms and tucked around the school. So it does take a little bit of planning and, and, and effort. Um, but I was taught how to go around each day just for a short period, yeah. uh, bring up different staff, 
talk things like don't always go on the same route so people can go here he comes at 10 o'clock again so yeah, yeah. And, and <laughs> different questions to ask uh, and apparently i also taught taught how to give praise and it's interesting i talked to a lot of leaders middle leaders and some senior leaders that go um, i never know what to say um well what if they haven't done anything i'll have to make something up and i go no you can yeah. never make something up but actually if you're observant in the same way as teachers are doing this in the classroom where we're constantly on the lookout to praise students and to reinforce the behaviors we want it's the same principle when i'm walking around i'm looking for things so I'm walking down the corridor, I see someone do something, whether it's a teacher or a support staff member, or, or, or perhaps doing something with a student where you can go, um, I really loved what you did with that student. What I particularly liked was A, B, and C, uh, and the impact they had. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, well done. You know, the power of that, people 10 foot tall, compared to an email saying, oh, and, thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm assuming that these kind of, insights and behaviors are, are how you've led to establish well-being I, I guess going back to inside well-being it, do i you know there's tips and tricks you know obviously you get the survey and there's a lot more stuff that you can offer but um how how do how do i pick up from this bit of wisdom uh, as a teacher or a leader using well-being where, where do i get all this brilliant information from you um, so that comes through our suggested actions. Um, so I wrote the first lot, actually just involved a lady called Kelly Halligan as well, who's um, doing lots of keynotes for BC, yeah. most of the bits, who's a um, mental health expert. Um, so between us, we've redone them and we're building on them all the time. Um, so when you run the survey based on your scores, you'll get up to... Um, different so some agreed actions and recommendations. Yeah, there's a toolkit which helps as well with further training and, and, and information. And it's particularly focused around leaders because it's that culture at the moment. We are building yeah. things out over the summer and, and long term to be able to um, support staff directly as well. But if you look at the staff wellbeing charter, the four commitments I always reference people to are commitment 11, which is about measuring and tracking. And you're all going to say, well, you would say that, Mark. It's what you do. And I'll, yeah. I'll reframe by saying, yeah, but as you do with students, if you're going to improve anything, you, you can't not measure, know where you're starting and know where you're finishing and the impact of action you take. Otherwise, you might repeat things that don't work or you might mm -hmm. repeat things that do. Um, and then there's commitment 10 and 3. 10 is protecting leader well-being and it's interesting that you know some of the lowest scores we always get particularly in secondary schools are from middle leaders and although senior leaders tend to score more highly on the surveys they take when they do it with a school last year we ran a national survey 8,000 people took part about a thousand senior leaders and mm -hmm. they gave the lowest scores so I am always a little bit suspicious that when senior leaders often I think when they take their own survey perhaps aren't as honest as they might be because they realise it is a job. That's very interesting, yeah. On, on them. I don't want to skew the results too, but too unfavourably. Yeah, yeah poss po po possibly. I, I, I haven't got any evidence for that um, other than it just seems peculiar that when we did it independently, we got very different results to when we do it um, by by um, schools. Um, you know, so, um, so we're really trying to help people, as I say, um, drive it. And then... Uh, three is giving leaders the tools. Um, so I just coming back to 10, you know, I know we, the much used oxygen mask is there, but it is really true that lots of leaders are selfless. They cover breaks uh, and duties for people. So other yeah. people have breaks and it's not sustainable. And you, we really need to help those leaders um, help themselves first because they're only going to be then in a fit state to help others. And, mm -hmm. and number three, commitment three, is is um, looking after, um, sorry, it's giving leaders their, the tools that they need to do the job. Because if you get three and ten right, um, then they're in a position to support everybody. Commitment two is the fourth one to do, which is um, helping staff take responsibility for their own well-being. People often want to run there and, and start doing that. And I go, I, I go, don't do that too much of it unless you've got three and ten right because otherwise you're firefighting all the time because you haven't got the, the, the resources in place to help mm -hmm. and support those, those people. Things like, number one, about raising well-being as, as, as a whole piece and, and, and other things will naturally come, and numbers will naturally come from doing those four. And probably the fifth one that we want to start to look at is flexible working. Um, and 
how schools can really start to adopt that because yeah and this is a big challenge for schools isn't it flexible working you know part-time requests you know circumstances at home family uh i'm I, I looking at some latest recruitment data today no surprise that um yes recruitment challenge still exists but it seems to be that more teachers are asking for uh, increased flexible work which is a good thing but that places demands on the individual school to allocate teachers to classes yeah and and it is and it is difficult because i know heads who are uh, kind of against it and i know heads who are very for it and have done things and of course there are the ambassador schools and i'm not going to change people's opinions on a on a, on a podcast about what, what's right no. obviously if i go back to business th probably 30 years ago now when we started having that same discussion because people forget um because it, it's almost accepted particularly in larger corporate organizations people forget that the same discussions were happening then where people were going well this will never work job shares won't happen um, yeah now now it does and it's comfortably in and i think people just need to perhaps look at their own circumstances but particularly we've got a high quality teacher and i would say now a high quality support staff member because actually for the first time where i'm a governor we're starting to find it a challenge to recruit good quality support staff and i know speaking to people at the conference last week that we're not um untypical um mm -hmm. you've got to ask the questions uh, you know really but whether it's people coming back from maternity leave whether it's people wanting uh, a little bit of flexibility uh, in terms of how they work um if it's the difference between that and losing people to the profession particularly as they, over the next few years birth rates work against us and various other bits um we probably do need to be a little bit more radical and so there's mm -hmm. that side but there's also the flexibility that people think are right, working from home now course support staff might be able to particularly in a map central team context um uh, challenge for teachers isn't it when they have to be with children physically but i know more and more uh, where they can they're doing ppa time at start and end of days and saying look you can come in go home and do it at home or or, or, or things people are so people are starting to look more creatively at these mm. kind of things and we've got people i actually met um, a ceo uh, who's seriously looking at this um from the trust who's saying his ambition actually is to take his trust to a four-day week right crikey i mean i saw i saw uh, uh, an organization that i use for part of my day work that they switched to four-day week which is interesting also I know, I, yeah i know many quite a number now of business yeah. of business that are doing that I, I guess the challenge from you know my life as a teacher the challenge as ever is if you've got the well, not the entire population yet, but slowly, maybe over time, you'll see. But while most of us still default to five days at work yeah. with children, I send my children, they've got to go to school. Schools are always going to be fixed to a, yeah. a, a Monday a kind of nine to five. But I suppose over time, we might start to see more schools collectively have to change the way they work to meet the kind of, it's that supply and demand chain, isn't it? And that's probably, and I guess the purpose of me raising that was because I was surprised to hear that, and I'm not um, kind of glibly sitting here saying, oh, we should all move there, because I know how challenging that is. I guess I was making the point that we probably all need to think about, rather than talking about what we can't do, is saying, well, think more about, well, what could we some do? alternatives? Yeah, yeah it's a good point. We might be able to make, and what are the little tweaks that could make a difference? Um, yeah. Uh, and particularly as, as recruitment gets even harder, as I think it sadly will do, um, uh, you know, we've got to, ha you know, the main thing is, it's a bit like um, us, you know, hanging, we, we've got a very good renewal rate uh, as we're trying to sell more, but it's much easier to hang on to a customer if you do it well than, mm -hmm. than it is to, to attract a new customer. And I guess in the same way, how do we help and hang on to our, our, our staff, particularly, I guess, those who are very good, um, uh, now, clearly, if if they're being promoted and we don't have a vacancy for them, then I, you know, how do we help them get promoted, and how do we help them for the benefit of the teaching profession? But also, they'll go away and tell everybody what a fantastic school they've come from. It'll help your attraction. Uh, they may come back as an even more senior person. So there's lots of things across that whole staff life cycle, which is probably a whole new, a whole different podcast talking about, you know, from attraction to farewell. Uh, you know, and, and, and covering recruitment and various other bits. But I guess the question for schools now is how do you stand out? Not just against other schools, um, but I guess against other industries. 
because it's not very helpful, I think. For yeah, you. it's a tough one, isn't it, to recruit new teachers? And, you know, I, 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 10, 15 years ago when I started my blog and, and now how I work and I think about all the possibilities for new teachers who might struggle in their first few years, how they can work for an education organisation online, create resources, earn their salary, that type of way. I think it's a, a big challenge for the teaching profession, not just other industries too. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree. As you say, it's, um, there's much more choice now. Um, uh, it's interesting. I don't know if you saw the local authority piece in the Times this morning, um, freedom of information requests and, and, and the number of staff in local authorities that um, were um, still working from home. In one case, it was right. 90 96 percent or 92 percent was the highest the lowest was 82 percent so nearly a fifth uh so a lot still yeah it's interesting choosing to work from home and the local authorities are letting them because actually there is there is evidence that productivity goes up when people are at home but clearly when you're in the teaching profession or the nhs or something um or a train driver i know that they're, they're going to have yeah, demand physically to be somewhere to physically be there um but the question is how can we help? What are the things we might do in our environments that yeah, can help? I agree. And the point I was going to make is, you know, um, when I look at job adverts or other stuff, everyone, you know, most of them, maybe not everyone, they all look the same. I can interchange them between schools. And so in some ways, it's kind of like if you want to stand out um, against other schools. And we don't, you know, unfortunately, it is a competitive market now. But particularly if you want to stand out against other professions, you know, what can you do in each of these stages to attract, yes. to recruit staff, to develop staff, to um, manage their performance, you know, he's going through, uh, uh, you know, uh, to retain them. Um, what, what can yeah, you... no, so you make a good point. I mean, I'm reminded of one school I, I worked with a few years back now and recently checked in with, throughout the pandemic and quite proudly on their website, they advocate, here are 50 things we do to support wellbeing for, for their staff. And um uh, it's a real standout moment for me because although some of the ideas are, you mentioned the phrase earlier, culture, not cake, there are a lot of cultural things that they do and there's a lot of cake and coffee things that they do also. And I, I, I tested them before and after the pandemic, I, I guess, are these things, you know, more than just a tick box or a kind of cake and tea exercise or actually are they established as part of the foundations of the school? And apart from covering for staff absences, which has been an issue for the pandemic, um, it, it, they, they, they kind of, I, I guess, say loosely evaluated from my perspective that they came out quite favourably. Yeah, and that's good. Well, obviously, what we could do with them is offer them an evidence-based survey. Yes. And we could give them external verification. But there you go, Bar Beacon and Walter, if you're listening. Um, right, Mark, I'm going to wrap things up because my podcast... Uh, normally it's half an hour, but we've had such an interesting conversation about such an important topic, and I hope people are uh, interested by the things you have to say. We'll, we'll do a few shout-outs and links to uh, where people can find out more. But um, I guess my takeaway message is culture, not cake. Okay, good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and obviously there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes with all that, but... Um, uh, uh, part of my podcast is I just summarise the whole conversation. I pose a few little quick questions to you and see if I can catch you off guard. So okay. no pauses or no hesitations <laughs> and no detailed uh, synthesis, uh, synthesis or <laughs> thesis type responses, if you can. Okay. Um, so it, it, I guess going back to Welby, um, what are the kind of things on your desk today that you're planning for September? Oh, for September. So um, the big thing we're doing is trying to form up all the many leads that we've generated um, at the conferences and other things we've been in to um, yeah. help schools set up for September. Um, so we hope... Busy time of year. We'll go, yeah, busy, bit, been very busy in the last um, few weeks. Um, the other thing is we've got some new products and, and, and things that I think... Well, I think we're already market-leading products. I expect by the end of this year uh, to be the world's uh, leading uh, product. I already have created a leaflet saying what does the world best... Right, there you go, world's leading. That's yeah. a bold claim. That's where we're heading. I, I think right. we're not far from it now. So uh, Good to hear. Um, now, before we came online, we talked about one of the books that you're reading. Can you let listeners know what that one is? Yeah, so uh, I was lucky enough at the CST conference to uh, jump into a workshop by Owen Eastwood. And so this is his book. He does happen to be sitting in her, on, on, on a desk about belonging. 
and it fits so well with what we're doing. Um, so for those that don't know Owen Eastwood, and I didn't know him, I knew of him, um, he's the chap that's helped Gareth Southgate over the last six years, really reconnect England with the fans. As he said when he get, got up on stage, he said, keep the faith. He said, don't let the last couple of performances un, uh, you know, um, uh, yeah. unwaver you. But he's, he's done so much more. But I was just struck with this um, sense of belonging and his Maori story. So if people are really interested in this idea of high-performance culture and well-being sits very much in there, then I'd, I'd highly regret. I'm only two chapters, three chapters in, having seen him talk, and I'm um, really loving it. Already hooked. So there you go, folks. Uh, I'm going to be adding, adding him into our some of our actions and some of the stuff. Right, OK. So the, uh, the book title, Sense of Belonging, is it called? No, just called Belonging, the Ancient, belonging. Okay. The ancient Code of Togetherness. Right, there you go. Uh, the fact, the more and more things I, I read and learn and research, it's, it's, that, it's going back to those points again, the belonging, the feeling looked after, the understanding and consultation. Uh, OK, finish this sentence. If I was Education Secretary of State? Um, I would obviously uh, invest money and put money forward specifically for staff wellbeing um, and, for, um, uh, and create greater capacity. Uh, so more teachers and, and more funding. Amen. Uh, and and uh, so you've had a varied career, Mark, in banking and, and etc. Um, I'm assuming that you're doing your dream job right now. But if it wasn't, what what what's your off the wall wacky career you'd love to have had? Well, it's not off the wall wacky. And, and in fairness, I loved I loved my time in in retail banking, being on an operating board. I've loved my time in schools and what have you. But actually, what I really wanted to do, and I know it sounds a bit corny, but my, I'm a mad nut about rugby and. If I could have done anything, I'd have played scrum half or fly half for England, even though I was a flanker uh, when I played. <laughs> I played I was there you Fantastic. Um, you know, that's what I would have, uh, I, you know, uh, I watch it now every every game. Not a great result on, on uh, Saturday, even though sure. it was a scratch team. But... This is, this is an, uh, an interesting question. Given that, you know, pandemic and that you can work remotely a little bit more rather than physically, how do you manage by walking about in an online world? It's a really good question, um, and you know, I'm just giving us a little plug because I can do it. Um, so we won, and there is a purpose. So we won the 2022 uh, Education Resource Awards, and we went up to uh, Birmingham, not knowing we'd won. Seriously, we went. I took I took my UK. So there's, there's about 18 of us in the business now, which some yeah. abroad are my tech people, but uh, I took the sort of um, nine out of ten of us that are in the UK um, there, and. Um, for uh, four of them, I'd never met them because we built right. the COVID pandemic. Uh, yes. So, uh, and I'm in, in Essex. Um, my, my PA is the closest to me, actually. She's 20 miles away. Uh, but my customer experience is, manager is, is down in Battle. I've got my uh, um, sales director in Liverpool. All over, yeah. Okay. And so, really, it's regular meetings. So, and, and some of my tech team in Pakistan. So, they have daily stand ups. I drop in. I mean, right. one of my tech team's um, birthday today. And okay. sending cards. We, we Don't tell me how it started. I think the first time. So, one of our traditions now on stand up when it's somebody's birthday, we, we sing them happy birthday. And it is, right. it is the most fun, it's the most awful. Um, <laughs> you've ever heard because you've got eight people who can't really I can't believe we've picked a team where nobody can sing and in fact the, the, the ones from abroad they even clap and sing different tunes so there's all of us doing this right but, so you, you guess you're managing by uh, yeah, we, rather than walking about by checking in online yes uh, and, and rather than say checking in I guess regular because the problem with checking in is I know you can it's almost like I'm checking up isn't it checking in but you, you're right well, I, guess, I guess the important message is Mark that you're also you know even in this online world you know we, we, we mentioned the phrase mental health here you, you get a good sense of where people are and you start to spot the signals early if you can, and then you can raise yeah, little red flags. But, but some of the things, um, I'm, I'm a big fan of um, Amy Edmondson's work, Psychological Safety, and clearly as a, as a wellbeing company, if we didn't have a psychologically safe culture, we weren't practicing what we preach, I think it would come over to our, our, our schools. Um, so I've got people abroad who, who tell, we don't, you know, we don't have any um, timestamps, we don't keep logs, we don't do anything. We meet them regularly. We talk about outcomes. Um, I've just had the annual review of because um, we were outsourced for a bit, and we've now got our own development team. And I've just done three annual reviews in, in the last month, talking to people. And 
give them a little pay rise and things like that. And um, yeah. but, but these people have all said, we want to be with you forever. And what they've talked, literally, and I'm not just saying that, and they've talked about the, the culture of trust, the fact that nobody checks in with me, the fact that they um, we talk about what you're going to deliver, but how they deliver it is up to them. Now, in fairness for them, I'm not a techie, so I couldn't actually help them decide how to build some code or various bits. Um, uh, so there's sometimes there's an advantage as a leader not having the detailed knowledge about what yeah, absolutely, yeah. do. Having said that, in every um, world I've worked in, I hope that's been something that's been close to me, that actually we might agree what the outcomes look like, and by that, you know, what, what, what we're aiming for, and I'll help them discuss. Uh, so tomorrow I'll be looking at our priorities, but I do it with my chief engineer, with with my um, uh, uh, kind of tech lead. I don't sit here and decide and then say, go and build all this. We do it together. And the same with the people, they're coming up with ideas and, and challenging us and saying, actually, there's mm-hmm. no way of building that. Why don't you think about this? So we have those discussions. So they all feel really like they're part of the team uh, and that actually they're really an important part of the team and, and that we care about them and we do. And mm-hmm. Um, and uh, well, uh, I mean, uh, I'm going back to that point, you know, three years in and getting through the pandemic, someone remind me not so long ago, if you're still operating and doing well at uh, this time, then you're doing really well uh, if you can get through the pandemic. I've got two questions left for you, Mark. Um, one, um, who would you recommend I interview next and why? Oh, that's a, that's a really hard one. There's, uh, so there's so many good, so I could, I could choose some of my uh, customers. Uh, I, I guess there's a couple of people that I, and I don't know if you've interviewed these people either, but um, uh, I met two people at the CST conference. Um, one one was Dame Alison Peacock, and actually, real, I never met her before, and yep. uh, I guess you get a view, but um, had some fantastic conversations about culture, leadership, well-being, so on the same way. I guess she'd make a very interesting yep. character. I also may, met Stephen Morgan, the um, Shadow Minister for Schools, who I have to say, when when uh, I was with Tom Rogers from, from uh, Teach Talk Radio as well, and he brought him over, and I looked at him. I didn't know who he was, and, and uh, I say that, and I was shaking hands, and he, he said, and my, I looked at him, I went, you're not old enough, was my first comment. <laughs> <laughs> you're not old enough. And he said, I'm, I'm, I'm 41, he said. My God, I said, you look, you look 31. He said, I feel 51. But we oh, had, there you go, wow. Well chat and, and and i guess i'm biased because he said how much he liked the platform and how neat it was and i asked me to get in touch but i just thought he had his head switched on about some of the things we discussed as well so well, um i, I, I would like that might yeah be- i would like to connect with him i mean i've no offense to alison alison i know really well and we have already had her on the podcast okay. and i'm a big fan of the chartered college and all the work that she's doing um and I know her views on how to reform education and policy um, and a really important messages. So if you're not familiar with Alison and the Charter College teaching, then please check it out. But as ever, always keen to find some new voices. Uh, I'll see if I can, I'll see how you get on with connecting with, with him and I'll try my luck too. Yeah, as I say, otherwise, you know, I can I can think of some great. Um, oh yeah, well, I'll, um, some of the CEOs and we'll, people. We'll add those into the blog version of the podcast. <laughs> and I, I guess just for people listening, um, is there anyone else in education that inspires you, Mark? Um, well, somebody, somebody early on that did when I first came out was uh, I met Tim Brighouse and um, yeah, and he looked he looked quite he looked like he was getting on then. I know he's still going go, going well, but uh, he actually wrote the forward to our book. Or, or sorry, one, yeah, one of the forwards. Um, there was, was more, but wrote a nice testimonial for, for for a book on. Yeah, he's a he's a brilliant uh, chap. So I, I love some of the things he said because again, you know, something's about the capacity about that that culture things all all all, 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 all come out um mm-hmm. so i i think there are i mean in terms of education uh, i'll give him a shout out um because he helps with my marketing but in terms of educating but in a different way but educating on how to sell things um nigel bottle from the um uh, entrepreneur circle is brilliant character as yeah. well um so he, educa- he educates me um and i think the one thing i've, I've said is um even though um, next year, believe it or not, I know you're all going to say I must have started, um, uh, 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 I must have been doing things to look, look this good, but next year, believe it or not, I can draw my um, pension. Um, oh, there we go. Time to put your foot up. No, no but I, I, won't, I won't be, but always before you do then, uh, my last question, um, 
Mark, is a, a question I always ask uh, people, I guess I always think about Teacher Toolkit and my digital legacy after I've gone. What what would you hope uh, well be to be your legacy or just, you, you know, your own work in all the different, you know, the industries you've done? What would you hope to be your legacy? Um, well, I'd like to think that people would just say about me, he gave far more than he took, uh, I guess, at a simple, a simple level. Um, but... You know what I what I'd really love, um, I guess, is that Welby plays its part in creating a, a sector where, uh, and I've said this was before. My, you know, when I close my eyes and think about schools where teachers and support staff skip in every day uh, with a smile on their face, um, jumping out of bed, <laughs> out of bed, can't wait to get in, uh, because they, 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 you know, every school, every college, every map, every education establishment has a culture where people really want to work and yeah. and can do their best work. And as a result of that, our 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 our, our children, our students, um, get their be- get the bu- best possible outcomes beyond just academia, but they get the best possible attainment and the best possible outcomes because they're surrounded by people that are able to do their best every single day and enjoy doing their best every single day. Yeah, so there you go. I was just trying to work out while you're um, explaining your kind of motivations. Um... You know, and just as a random addendum to finish off, but you know, 350 schools times X number of staff times X number of pupils, you're you're probably having a, quite a big impact already, eh? Yeah, I, I like to think so, absolutely. And the good news is a lot of those schools have renewed, um, so we, we, we're into second year with, with many of them and, and, and third year. And in fact, our very early pilot schools from, uh, from um, Northern Ireland, we've got some of those with us, and they're into their fifth surveys, because uh, some of those were manual based, not digital. So, yeah, um, yeah I, I'd like to think so. The bit we haven't talked about, you know, I did a character curriculum and also helped co found a charity that um, put 300,000 people through the B, uh, 250 to 300,000 students through the B, Be the Best You Could Be program. So, yeah. you know, I can, I, you know, I, I could die happy to say I have made a difference in places, but I think the journey, even though, as I said, I'm getting on a bit, but I, I feel like my journey's only just starting and the, um, the key thing is to is to learn all the time learn from the mistakes you make and my god I, I you know I've got no regrets in my life because what's the point of having regrets because you can't do anything about them but god I've made made some mistakes. not make the mistakes again and move on I, I yeah say. and I, 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 make, I make mistakes every day because if, if you don't take action if you're not doing things if you're not pushing boundaries then um, you know um, you, you're not making mistakes so for me they kind of come hand in hand and as you say, um, you just take them on the chin and you say, right, what do I do differently now? How do I learn from that uh, and move on? Sure. Um, so, uh, you know, making mistakes, moving on, um, reflecting. And again, I, I keep trying to find this common thread, you know, understanding staff, taking in their views, you know, help being looked after and giving them that sense of belonging. And, and that, uh, uh, there's a blog in there, Mark, you'll know from me, cult, uh, culture first, not and cake second or something along those lines. Um, but I'm going to wrap things up. Um, and we, we will share all the links for people listening online to Wellbe and a couple of things that I've been working with Mark already um, on, on the site. It's a, uh, I, I have worked with a lot of ed tech companies throughout my years as a teacher blogger. And I think without question, you stand out, Mark, as not only a great tool, but uh, incredibly affordable. Um, so for what school leaders out there that aren't doing anything to um, look at how they can support their school staff with well-being and use that hard data to inform school priorities, it's a big recommendation from me. So Mark, I'm gonna thank you for your time um, I look forward to connecting with you again in the future. And for people um, who are listening to you online or watching on the video, what, what's the web address? So it's um, wellbe.co.uk. You can get everything everything from there. There's our learning center there as well. Uh, our pricing's transparent. Um, we give and a again, full- if we, they've listened to this very last 30 seconds of our podcast, they can get a, they can get a little discount from, from me, can't they, as a friend? Yeah, they can. So we do a premium for pros, so that'll knock at least 45% off. Um, right, there you go. I'm glad I asked. <laughs> we're a 10% off pro. So if you look at the pricing page, because everything about this is transparent, um, we give a, a money-back guarantee. And we wouldn't want anybody to, uh, 
to uh, we wouldn't want to hang on to anybody's money that didn't love what we do. I think we're there you go. to a lot of people. We're trying to kind of be a discipline, and we are fun to work with, um, d- despite the, the challenges that um, that there. We try and make it. Uh, uh, we try and make it easy. Uh, to, to work with us. So there you go. What, what's not to like? Get your money back uh, or stick with them. And like Mark said, he works hard to keep hanging on with current customers. I'm going to end things there, Mark. I was going to say, um, it's not a challenge, I was going to say, Ross. We've not claimed on it yet, but hey, I'm sure we'll... Well, there you go. Well, that's a good endorsement. <laughs> uh, so I've been talking with Mark Solomon, founder of Wellbe. My name's Ross McGill, Teacher Toolkit. Thanks for listening, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Thank you.